They were pitching shell after shell into our lines, the air seemed full of singing and whistling demons. Then we got into the rifle fire and I give you my word, it was like a hailstorm. They did not seem to be firing bullets, they were coming down in sackfuls. The first shot we got at us, we looked around awestruck. But after that we went on, some whistling, some singing, others smoking. I have a pipe I had given to me. I do not believe we were in our proper senses as regards our lives. All we wanted to do was go on. The order came to retire, so back we had to come. As soon as they said retire, our hearts went. We were done up. While going forward, we did not notice thirst or distance or tired limbs. But as we marched back and knew we were beaten, we felt it all. We slunk off as slow as possible, some praying for a bullet to end their misery. All of us said that those who were hit ought to be glad to get out of the misery we were in. It was a cruel day, but we are going to have another go at them. Just a few lines to let you know I'm still in the land of the living, and hope I shall be when you get this. We are now in camp at Modder River, and I am told it is about 20 miles from Kimberley, where we are bound for, and I do not think we shall go any further than that. We have had some rough experiences since we started. Our first camp was at Orange River, where we lay some days in peace and then our battles commenced. But we marched about 14 or 16 miles to our first engagement to Belmont. We get to about three miles of them and stayed there the night, and started just before dawn and got quite close to their position, which is on a hill, before they knew we were there. We charged them with cold steel, but they had retired about six or eight hundred yards by the time we got to the top, and so we had to open fire on them and we gave them as much lead as we could, until they gradually fell back and we flanked them and drove them in another direction and cut them up fearfully. My battalion lost nine killed, besides wounded, but I do not know how the Boers got on, for we never see many of their dead or wounded. I believe they have holes made ready before the battle, for some of their dead have been found close to the top of the sand. They carry off a lot of wounded in wagons when they can get away. Our second battle was at Honeyness Kloof, but we did not do so much there, only a few long-range volleys, but we lost a few wounded and then this last affair was something awful. Our artillery had been shelling a hill for some little time, and we advanced. Some left, and some right. Our lot on the left was the first under fire. The Boers were entrenched out of sight, and we gradually advanced into a regular death trap. Our front line, with a maxim, was mowed down in no time. I was in the second line, and was about 800 yards away, and oh, Mr Wheeler, I will never forget it. The poor fellows were falling right and left, and we had to retire about a hundred yards to cover. And in doing so, my company lost two NC officers wounded. Once there, we could do little. In fact, we lay there firing until our rifles were almost red hot, and then we got one by one down the river bank and got a bit closer to them, and there we lay. We started about eight in the morning and kept on continually until about eight in the evening. And then we were supposed to attack them, but we did not. And in the morning, we moved round to another position and found they had vanished. And, I believe, are retiring on Kimberley. Hoping Mrs Wheeler, yourself and Gertie are all well. I remain yours truly. C.T. Butt. Dear father and mother, Just a few lines which I trust will find you quite well, as I am thankful to say it leaves me at present. On Tuesday last, the 24th, we were in action for the first time. We marched away from camp about 4.15am. We had proceeded about seven miles along the road when we were ordered to attack the enemy, who were holding a strong position behind a very high hill off the road to our left. My company was the first to leave, leading the way across some open fields. We had not got very far before the enemy opened fire on us with their artillery, the first shells dropping only a few yards away. Luckily for us, it did not explode. As we neared their position, the rifle bullets fell around us like hailstones. I will not attempt to describe the fight, no one can form any idea of the battlefield unless he has experienced it. We lost our colonel, and about ten men killed and fifty-four wounded. And yet there we were, smoking our pipes as cool as ever, not knowing but when the next shot might carry us off. We were under fire for five hours. Then we retired and marched back to camp fairly done up. After a few hours sleep, I was sent off with nine men to guard one of the roads leading to Ladysmith, where I am now. I shall never forget the fight of Tuesday last. We all had narrow escapes. Once I turned round to look back, and there just behind me was one man dead and another wounded. Not ten yards off lay the colonel, also dead. The Boers won't fight in the open, but get behind boulders on the top of hills and fire down on you. Bullets keep firing around you, but you can't see a thing to fire at. 
I saw some close shots. Some were shot through the helmet, others through the coat which we carry rolled on our backs, through the sleeve just grazing the arm, and another one I saw where the shot had lodged in the heel of a man's boot. Talk about heat. It is enough to scorch your eyes out. If ever I come back, I shall have some tales to tell, and I mean to take some of Kruger's whiskers back with me. You may think it is all right up here, but it is cruel, what with the sun in the day and the perishing cold at night. We are living on bully beef and biscuits. There is a fellow out here in the foot guards who has been shot eight times and is now better in walking about. We are going on to a place called Blomfontein. I don't think it will last much longer after we get all cavalry out here. At least they all seem to say so. We only lost 15 horses altogether coming out, so we did not do so badly. Goodman was the luckiest bloody soldier I've ever met. <laughs> in October, he was summoned before the court for public indecency. He bathed nude in Halliford's swimming bath, see? <clears throat> I don't know what his sentence would have been, but he never even went to trial. He'd already been shipped out here to Africa in September. I remember the first time I ever saw him. Hair slicked back, a thick army jacket he refused to even take off in the scorching heat. The biggest, blackest boots I've ever seen. He was standing there, smoking his pipe. It was like he couldn't even hear the bullets falling all around us like hailstones. I shouted to him, get on the ground, Lieutenant. <laughs> Took a long drag of his pipe, smiled at me and said, jolly good, Sergeant. Goodman's first brush with death must have been at Ladysmith. I won't attempt to describe the fight to you. It was too horrible. No one can form any idea of the battlefield unless he's experienced it firsthand. Goodman had lost his pipe by this point. <laughs> he was still wearing the boots. They shone brightly in the sunlight. I swear he spent more time polishing them than he did sleeping. Boots saved his life in a way. We thought the coast was clear and I gave the order to move up. Big mistake. A torrent of sniper fire came over the hill. Ten men died, 54 were shot. One of them was Goodman. But he wasn't wounded. The bullet had lodged itself in one of those bloody big boots of his. Jolly good, Sergeant, he said, astonished when he realised. Jolly good, I replied. He killed himself yesterday. No one really knows why. He always seems so jovial. I suppose for the past few days he was a bit quieter than usual. He stopped smoking the pipe. I hadn't seen the jacket for a while either. He did leave a note. I was the only one to read it. I entered his chambers last night. One of my relatives had sent me a pipe from home and I'd stopped smoking a long time ago, so I was gonna give it to him. I don't know how long he'd been dead. Nobody heard the gunshot. The room was soaked with blood. Goodman's bunkmate had to be transferred. I picked up the note and as, as I saw it, it didn't explain anything. It just said three words. Jolly good, Sergeant. Another fight. Another battle. The shells never stop, man. They're a constant barrage, a constant wave of constant rage and they never stop. We fought for seven days and nights, Mum. Still we lost. Seven days of the hot sun and seven nights of the bitter dark. Seven nights of watching our backs and seven days of lying on hilltops with guns to our eyes. Can you see it? Can you imagine how it must be, Mum? Out in the wasteland for seven days and seven nights. We had only what we stood up in, clothes on our backs, trying, 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 still we lost. I suppose I shouldn't grumble, Mum. I'm back at camp now and I never once got shot. 
even Saturday last, when we took one hill and the boys took another and the shells didn't stop until Sunday evening. I never stopped, Mum. I can hear them now. I can feel them. Although the battle is over. I, I said I shouldn't grumble, and I shan't. I, I thank God, Mum. <laughs> I thank him every blessed day. I, I never once got shot, not once. I, a, a splinter of a bullet got stuck in my hand, but that, that was nothing. Twenty people were shot around me, Mum. Twenty friends, twenty soldiers, twenty men. They were just men, Mum. Just men. And they fell all around me in the shells that never stopped. While I was hit by nothing but a splinter. <laughs> they died, Mum. They, they died. Even the officer was hit. Shot in the leg further down the hill. And I had nothing but a splinter. It happened again and again. We stayed. Three days and three nights on that hilltop. Mum, and every day and every night and every night and every day, more men died. Just men. And the worst that happened to me was aching my muscles from lying still for so long, watching the sun rise and set against the silhouetted boars. But never mind, Mum. That's what we must say here, when we live and others die. Never mind. Honour the noble 600 in the valley of death. Is that not what we must say? Honour the dead. Savour the living. I am savouring the living, living Mum. The living and living as we continue to fight. We cannot think too hard on the dead. We cannot let it change us. We, we cannot let its sadness hurt us, kill us. I, I am the same as when I left home, Mum. I, I think. I'm, I'm just the same. And I'm, I'm just as happy. We have to be here, or what will we be? I'm just the same, Mum. I, I don't think it's changed me. It, it, it can't. Has it? Can you see me? Can you tell I'm happy, Mum? I'm happy, I won't let it make me sad, hurt, dead, because we cannot think too hard on the dead. The dead are dead, after all. And the shells keep falling here on the living. I, I must. We must, you must stay the same. The same and sane. Can you hear me, Mum? Can you? Mum? Three days and three nights we have ridden this train with nothing but dog cakes and coffee again. The cold nights are long and the warm days inane, with nothing but the engines and walls of this train. Well, Christmas arrived and fast disappeared, reminding us all of just how long we've been here. And oh, how we feasted. Oh, how we cheered when the officer brought out the biscuits and beer. The presence of scarves and a cap and a pipe. Red meat from the can, what a treat, what a sight. Goodwill from the Queen as she praises our fight. And then onto this train in the dead of the night. We see tops of the mountains, the railway must climb. The skeletons sleeping in the droves by the line. The ostriches ducking their heads on the plain. For three days and nights we have spent on this train. Our rifles are set as they come in the night. We watch by the doors, we're ready to fight. And we are happy and well, and despite this quite sane, as we wait out the three days and nights on this train. Now the journey must end, for the boars await, both the men that we fight and the captives we take. I shall not have much time to write home again. No more days, 
no more nights will be spent on this train. If only the British were quite as splendid as the good people of Africa. As soon as we arrived here, they met us with, I kid you not, as many pineapples as we could carry. How quaint, how wonderfully charming. If that wasn't enough, they offered us tea and tobacco and matches and treated us as if we were heroes. Do they know we are fighting their countrymen? Perhaps not. One does tend to be told in Britain that such savages know nothing at all. You know the spiel, don't you, dear? I remember how it angered you when the top dogs back home started to say it was our duty to redeem these heathen souls. What rot, simply preposterous. Even if they are not sure who we actually are, I doubt savages would know how to make such marvellous cups of tea as they have been providing. I do understand where the idea comes from, though, my dear. And don't get angry at me saying it. If you are here to lay your own eyes upon such wild, untamed land, it is hard not to wonder if the people are not wild as well. One railroad, my dear, one railroad. And so much open country, where it is not uncommon to see wild beasts simply foraging along. I'm sure you would understand if you were here. And I'm sure you would love it. Think of the art you could produce. I look forward so much to seeing all that you have painted since I've been away. In other news, my dear, we have discovered an abandoned German vessel holding crate after crate of sardines. And so we shall be feasting on not only pineapples, but fish in their thousands. Such is the excitement of life. If we had also discovered bread, which, sadly, we have not. In truth, there is little else to tell you at present. We are doing little more than rebuilding our camp every morning, when the rains of the night have caused it to sink into the mud. Or, on the rare occasion when this has not happened, we are scavenging in the wreck of an armoured train that was found nearby. So far, we have come up with little more than a considerable amount of metal. I'm not quite sure why we expected anything else. We leave camp tomorrow, my dear, and so I hope I shall soon have more to tell you. There may even be a place to post this from. Now, oh, what a delight that would be. War is such a lot of waiting around, we almost look forward to battle. This, too, is simply preposterous, but it is strange what we learn to enjoy. Scavenger hunts. The thought of it. I could almost be little Tim, searching for treasure in country fields and abandoned barns. Please do tell him, my dear, that I am thinking of him. I hope to hear all about him when you reply. Anyway, I hope you are well. I will toast your health with a good sardine, as the stout we had has sadly irretrievably vanished into the mud. Take care, my dear. It should not be long now. P.S. This is a note from Privates Wright and Brown. Private Thompson was killed in battle two days ago, and this letter was found among his belongings. We thought it right to send it anyway, so you can share everything he wanted you to know before he died. He was a good man, and this wasn't right. None of it is right. None of it. <laughs>